This talk that I'm going to give is not the talk that I originally intended to give. Um, since this summer, God has been putting on my heart to talk about uh, issues of protecting the environment. Um, and I thought I had a pretty clear idea of what that meant. I was going to give a talk on the various technological solutions to environmental problems facing us, social justice issues, uh, and then highlight a number of organizations and encourage everyone to uh, get involved in those organizations. And, uh, and above all, what I wanted to see was uh, that our, our testimony to the world um, in the way that we treat nature uh, really needs to be improved because the, the world is watching and we've not taken leadership role in that. As I actually started to try and put this together and really dived into prayer, I found God pushing me in a different direction. And as I really started to look at the scriptures on this, uh, it, it really came down to the heart issues. You see, Technological things, talking about species diversity, conservation. As a scientist, I'm very comfortable with these topics. And uh, when it comes to heart issues, I can't claim that I'm any better than anyone else. In fact, I may be noticeably worse than the average on these issues. Um, but this is what God has uh, asked me to talk about. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, so I'd like to start with this verse, uh, just to remind everyone that while, this, while issues of the environment are an important issue, uh, we are not necessarily going to uh, agree point for point with the world. Uh, in Romans, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, and what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are called to march to a dr different drummer, as it were. Uh, when Jesus showed up on the earth, um, he was frequently accused of not being with the times. Um, and Jesus says this, But to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace, calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say to him, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Your wisdom is justified by her deeds. So we have this cultural climate that wants to sort of set a tone uh, for everything that they, they do. And uh, if we are not conforming to the world, Sometimes we will be grieving when everyone else is rejoicing. Sometimes we'll be rejoicing when everyone else is grieving. We're not necessarily going to be in sync. And so our core identity needs to have this biblical foundation. We need to be listening to what God's saying. Um, so I was talking with um, Mace um, about this, and, and she really, I think, pointed out uh, a really good way of looking at this uh, biblically. The environment is not treated as a separate issue in the Bible. It is treated holistically. And uh, we tend to only look at the ecological impact of things, but there's actually three pillars, as she puts it. Uh, there's economics, what is affordable, you know, trade, all of these things. There's the ecological side of things. Uh, preserving nature, beauty, species diversity. And then there's also ethical considerations. Is it right to, is it right to take? Is it, uh, you know, how much can we give? And looking at a biblical foundation, we really need to have this, this whole world perspective on what it means. So I'm going to try and look at this a little bit chronologically. Right at the beginning, Genesis 1, we see our first identity um, is, is set up uh, in regards to nature. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. 
And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the, name gave, so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. This was our first job, was to, to be involved in nature and to take care of it, and also to give it names, which is, I, I, I still get amused by this. Today we call this taxonomy. Um, and it's, it's part of what we've been called to do. So how serious, really, uh, is taking care of the environment? Is this like a side issue? Is it, you know, going to be our whole religion? Um, wh where is this kind of on the important scale? Um, so looking through the Bible, we can find in Leviticus, uh, as God is laying down the rules for how to take care of the land, he gives this warning. Um, if people do not obey the law of Moses, he says, then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. The land will have its rest and enjoy its Sabbaths all the time it lies desolate. Um, the land will, uh, will have, it, have the rest it did not have the Sabbaths you lived in it. So we're going to look at the verses um, that, that are underlying this. But fundamentally, God laid down a law and then said, if you don't follow this law, I will destroy your entire nation. So that, that sets the importance level. Um, so Jesus, uh, many biblical scholars also believe that Jesus was referencing this uh, when he was talking with Peter. Peter asked him, how many times uh, should I forgive if a brother sins against me? Up to seven times. And uh, Jesus says to him, I don't say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, which is 490. So why do we think this is a reference? Um, because if you look in Second Chronicles and Jeremiah, the Babylonian captivity uh, lasted 70 years. And the logic for this was that, uh, was that Sabbath years were supposed to come every seven years. So 70 times seven is 490 years that Israel was living in the land and they were not following the laws that, that, uh, that God laid out for them for giving the land rest. And so, um, uh, and so they were, they were basically put into captivity and it was enforced. You will give the land rest. So what's the big deal? Why, why is God so hard on this? So let's look at, uh, in numbers when the spies were originally going in to see the promised land. Like what is the promised land? Uh, it says when they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. Now this is not one grape cluster. We generally don't have this nowadays, but it's a visual image to give you, uh, give you a look at this. The Valley of Eshkol, um, we can actually look these up on the map. And so I tracked down where this place is uh, based on, you know, what Bible scholars are saying. And I found that exact place in, um, uh, in the modern day. Okay. So, uh, when, when I first started reading the Bible as a child, I didn't have any pictures, right? All I had was the words that in the Bible and the descriptions of the promised land include forests. They include, you know, lush fields full of wheat and, 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 and all these great descriptions. And when I saw modern day pictures of the same area, uh, I was very surprised. So this is, uh, this is modern day Eshkol Valley. Uh, this is the promised land or at least what's left of it. 
And uh, here's another photo. This is just on the street. You can see the land is uh, it's arid. It's uh, fairly barren. They still do grow grapes here, um, but it hasn't. It doesn't have the same kind of lushness that was the original promised land. So I'd like to point out that climate change is not necessarily a new phenomenon. We've pretty much always been uh, depleting land that we live on. We've been causing species extinctions. And God promises to hold us accountable for that. So here's the original uh, verses that that um, God asked us to... Uh, well, God asked the Israelites to um, follow when they came into the promised land. He says, For six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you. But it's not just about the land in the Bible. Um, It continues. Count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years, so that the seventh Sabbath year amounts to a period of 49 years. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return your fi- to your family property and to your clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine. And you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Throughout the land that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. This is a really profoundly different method of economics and, uh, and, and taking care of things than what we have right now. What this means is that even if uh, one Israelite sold land to another Israelite, it would revert back to its original ownership every 50 years. So this is a, a really interesting dynamic to compare against uh, the way that we usually do capitalism now, where the idea is, you know, we need to be able to trade, we need to be able to uh, basically collect resources at the people that are best at business management. And what this does in the long run is it can create a cycle of generational poverty. The people that have get more and the people that have little get nothing. And God did not necessarily forbid people from from loaning money, from buying lands and all of these things. But he has periodic resets um, in place that keep these processes from spiraling out of control. And he treats the land in the same way that he treats the people. And that's really kind of the heart issue here is that the way that we, the way that we uh, interact with our money, with our resources, it reflects the way that we, inter- uh, that we see other people and how we think it's you know, okay to treat them. So in Deuteronomy 15, it says, at the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. Every seventh year, each of you must free any fellow Hebrews who have sold themselves to you. After they have served you six years, you must let them go free. This is a really interesting verse to contrast with our modern ideas of slavery because in the law that God gave us, in the, in the perfect transcendent um, 
uh, law and God saw all of history, there is allowances for things called slavery. And yet, as I read through this, I realize that this system is possibly preferable to what we have today with loans. Can you imagine if you only, uh, you know, if the, the longest duration of a loan was uh, seven years? I still have uh, student loans that will follow me for decades. Uh, the, the median uh, income uh, to get a down payment on a median priced house in California has gone from uh, five years in the 1970s to over 40 years today. That means that our economics, the way it's set up now, you will have to work a decent job from your 20s till you're 60 years old until you have the right to start having a loan so that you can pay off your house eventually. In this system, there is uh, hard caps put on on what on basically how bad things can go, and and that there's a genius to the system. Um, it also says in the same chapter, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving to you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Um, I don't have this exact verse, but it, it specifically says, you know that you're going to need to cancel debts, and I'm telling you to... Uh, to uh, be be open handed with loans, so this gets to this heart issue of generosity and uh, and being able being willing to help out others and yet there 's still a system of ownership there 's still a system of accountability, but it never runs away from us entirely so god 's solutions here address core issues that still plague us today. A uh, big one is soil depletion. Um, in the original talk, I was going to talk about you know how we've gone from feet of topsoil to bare inches, and our our high yield agriculture is exactly the opposite of what God is describing here with letting the you know just leaving the land alone and letting weeds grow in it. Um, it that allows the soil to get replenished. Um, it's, you know, we talk about crop rotation now, but there's these deeper heart issues of resource anxiety. Some people call it income insecurity of land ownership. Do we have, you know, the landed nobles and the working peons of generational poverty? Um, we talk a lot about the social justice issues of empire and everything, but it really boils down to if your parents' parents had a lot of money, then you probably still have a lot of money because these things are self-feeding cycles. We have long-term debt issues that people can never quite escape. Uh, it addresses equality and accountability. People are still responsible for their own actions uh, within limits. And by allocating the land by families, it preserves family cohesion over the long run. I have uh, relatives who own a large amount of agricultural land, and they think about sustainability differently than a company would because it's their children's land, and they're raising their grandchildren. And, you know, they want to make a profit but they also want to make sure that their grandchildren will, will have land to use. It's a different attitude. So now we get to these heart issues. And I think there's really three core issues here. Fear. Fear causes us to clutch what we have. It's the opposite of generosity. It says, I have this and it might go away and 
I need to hoard what I have. Greed says, I have this, but I could have more. You know, I've, I've been, I've been okay, uh, charging this amount of rent, but the market has changed, and so now I could charge more. Uh, I could get this thing, which is, um, you know, enough, but I could have more. And selfishness. Who is it that's going to benefit? Should I really do things that benefit only other people at my own expense? And I would posit that these, that these come into the same three areas we talked about earlier. Economic, ecological, and ethical. So let's talk about resource anxiety. Leviticus 25. You may ask, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? God says, I will send you such a blessing in the seventh year that the land will yield enough for three years. God is setting up this law specifically to challenge our, our inbuilt heart issue of uh, you know, I, I have to work that extra bit because I might not have enough. Um, and our, our impulse, sort of fear-driven urge to, to hoard and to store up. And he first addresses this in Exodus when, uh, when the Israelites leave Egypt. Um, they're wandering in the desert for 40 years. How do you feed a nation in the desert for 40 years? Um, he did it with manna from heaven, miraculous providence. And I could preach a whole sermon on miracles and what we can and cannot control. But the simplest way to put it is that if you have a miraculous source of food, you have no control over it. What if the miracle just doesn't happen the next day? You're trusting in the source of the miracle. Um, and God set it up. He knew the people's hearts. So he said, um, everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. This is gathering manna off of the ground. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it till morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. One of the uh, earliest stories I've heard of my father, and I can really relate to this, when he was only three years old, uh, he was given a biscuit. And he asked for a biscuit, he was given one, and he held it in his hand. He looked at it, and then he said, may I please have a biscuit? And um, his mother said, well, yes, after you've eaten that one. And he said, well, I would like one now. She asked him why. And his response was, if I eat this one, then I will, uh, then I won't have anything. But if I hold on to this one and you give me another, then I can eat that one. And then as a three-year-old planning on falling on hard times, he will still have another biscuit. <laughs> Uh, when he's done. This is, I can really relate to this urge. So, uh, yeah, God forced everyone to, to trust in him. And then on the Sabbath, he demonstrated his power to change the rules a little bit. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. Now, this is the opposite of what he just said a couple of verses ago. So they saved it until morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, and it did not get maggots in it. So Jesus himself said, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. God is in charge and in control of the things that destroy wealth. He can preserve or he can destroy, and we need to trust in him. And the way that he asks us to interact with our, our wealth uh, encourages us to trust in him. 
So where is this all going? What's 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 the end of history? This all so far has seemed very Old Testament. I'm not saying we should follow the law exactly, but I think it's very informative. Um, so let's let's look at the Book of Revelation on the on the far side. We the Bible describes a city they call it Babylon that is defined by wealth prosperity and greed and a lot of the book of revelation is about god's judgment on the city it says in revelation 11 the time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants the prophets and your people who revere your name both great and small and for destroying those who destroy the earth so the people that are opposed to God are labeled as those who destroy the earth. And God promises to meet that with, with, with retribution. It is a life and death issue. In Jeremiah 34, it says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed freedom to your own people. This is in reference to that uh, to that law about freeing slaves. So now I proclaim freedom for you, declares the Lord, freedom to fall by the sword, plague, and famine. And then later it says, their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. So the Bible treats these as very closely linked issues, issues of debt and slavery and issues of of taking care of nature, of being able to have some margin, have some extra. And the promise is quite severe. If we don't leave this margin, then our nations, our, our very bodies, will, uh, will be the thing that makes up the difference, the thing that, that feeds the animals. Uh, this is very Old Testament, but uh, it's the same God. And uh, so... I have to be thankful that uh, Jesus' grace protects me from this because this scares me, to be frank. Like, I'm not, my hands are not clean in this area. Um, finally, a big issue nowadays is international trade. It was less of a big deal uh, in the past, but today this is a big issue. So in Revelation again it says, and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, and all kinds of scented wood. I like walking through the marketplaces with all of these things. All kinds of articles of, of ivory, um, articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves. That is human souls. All the shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all those who trade on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of the burning city. Uh, what city was like the great city? This is a really stark image. Um, and yeah, it doesn't fill me with a lot of warm feelings. But this is what the Bible teaches about these issues. So I'm going to pose a question to you. Who is the city? Uh, who is Babylon? people that benefit from all of these boats going to and from bringing all of these materials. I would say it's us. I would say, you know, as, as uh, wealthy people, you know, London, New York, um, these are places that sit on many waters. Um, the, the American uh, Navy is larger than every other Navy on the planet combined currently. Um, these are still very real and pertinent issues today. And uh, God asks us, commands us even, to step out of that culture, to step out of that context, and to not be conformed 
to this society of greed. Because ultimately, that, that long list of resources, the, all the things that we can bring to ourselves, it ends with slaves. And God says you're trading in human souls. Okay, so now a little bit, a uh, little bit uh, more upbeat. So, what are things that we can do? Um, so, how can we nurture uh, nature into an ongoing celebration of life? We've been put in as uh, we've been given dominion of the earth. We've been given the tools to do this. I think. And so, uh, what can we learn from what God has created? I believe that there are solutions uh, that are already present in um, in nature, uh, but a lot of this has to do with price pressure. I originally wanted to say in my talk that renewable energy was cheap, that we had uh, solutions that, if you looked at it in the long run, they would actually be more cost effective. But as I looked at the hard issues with that, um, it became clear that, that that's actually never true. Um, and that saying, well, I'm always going to take the cheapest possible route is not a biblical attitude. So I'll give you two examples. Um, let's say that you have uh, two companies that both offer the same service. They put up advertising posters around the city. And there's no legal requirement to take these posters down when you're done. Now, one company wants to make sure that they're not cluttering up the city with trash, and so they would like to take the posters down. Another uh, company just wants to put them up and leave them there indefinitely. So that means that whatever cost-saving, cost-reduction you can possibly imagine for the sort of eco-friendly, litter-free company, if it's actually a cost savings, then then the first company can also offer exactly the same thing. So, uh, you know, if they hire people to go out and collect all of the trash and bring it back in afterwards, that's an additional cost. If they use a different kind of paper that's biodegradable, that's an additional cost. If it weren't an additional cost, both companies would use it. So whenever you're, whenever you're telling yourself, I'm just going to take the cheapest option, what you're doing is putting price pressure on the economy, uh, on all of these companies, making lots of little small decisions. And it basically boils down to, I'm going to take every shortcut possible or, or push off this as much as possible so that I can either, because of fear, I need this money, or because of greed, I could do twice as many posters if I didn't clean up. So in nature, we see the exact opposite pattern. Nature is not perfectly efficient, and we should all be thankful for that. Uh, if plants absorbed all of the light coming from the sun, uh, the, we would all uh, freeze or starve. Um, if, if, uh, if living things were built out of the strongest materials possible, things like carbon nanotubes, uh, they can't be broken down. So we know that living things are capable of building carbon nanotubes, but they don't, because it would, over time, kill the whole planet. Um, but these are the mistakes that we are doing. So I'll give you an example. Um, this is uh, something I learned about called um, uh, oxodegradable plastics. Well, often confused with degradable, uh, biodegradable plastics, oxodegradables are a category unto themselves. They're neither a bioplastic nor a biodegradable plastic, but rather a conventional plastic with an additive in order to imitate biodegradation. Oxodegradable plastics quickly fragment into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics, but don't break down at the molecular or polymer level like biodegradables. So this results in uh, little microplastics being left in the environment for hundreds of years. You may have heard of the great uh, plastic or uh, the great waste patches in the Pacific. The actual thing that's happening is a little bit more complicated than that. Plastic breaks down into very small pieces 
And this ends up in our drinking water. So we drink or, or consume about a credit card's worth of plastic every week, um, which is probably not healthy. Um, but why would someone bother to go to the go to all of the resources to make this thing that looks like it's biodegradable, but it isn't? Because people are saying, I want to feel good about having biodegradable things, but I still want the cheapest. I still want the best. I want the best, strongest plastic for the cheapest price. Oh, and it should also be biodegradable. And so what you end up with is this sort of fake version. So I think the, the heart issue is really this price pressure. We've already seen in the Bible this eventually leads towards issues of slavery. So if we want to get lower and lower prices, uh, one way of doing that is by pushing off um, that pressure onto other countries, other peoples that don't have the kind of choices that we have. Um, so we now have s some solutions available for this, but it's always going to be more expensive, right? Because we're not hurting as many people. Um, we can track fair trade. We can buy direct from farmers. We can hold companies accountable for these, uh, for these accidents. But that's, that's got to happen in, in each individual person's attitude. Um, we can also learn to recycle like nature. So the way that nature does this is that there's a, a very small list of materials that everything is built out of, amino acids, carbohydrates, uh, lipids, or fats. Uh, and everything from oak trees to viruses to humans were all built out of the same stuff. And so that makes literally everything biodegradable. You put anything in a moist environment, it will break down and can be used to build new life. If uh, what that would look like in our manufacturer would be using uh, fewer types of plastic uh, so that we could have recycling uh, pathways for each type of plastic. Right now we do hundreds because, hundreds of slightly different chemistries because we're not really that concerned about what happens to them. Um, we could build products to be repaired, to use interoperable parts, instead of just as soon as something breaks slightly, we just throw it away. And um, we already have at the bottom here is just a little tiny clip of a massive uh, map that we have of all of the biochemical pathways. So most of the, the chemicals that we're interested in producing, they are already produced in nature, and we already have uh, biological solutions that we can use for them. The issue is they are less efficient, right? Uh, because they don't produce any toxic byproducts. Um, so if we use those organic solutions, then nothing will stay in the environment forever. It can all be reused. Now, there's an issue or an attitude which I think um, is, is not quite biblical. We have this idea that we're going to be reducing, that we're going to be using less. But actually, that's not really what nature does at all. It's not an issue of quantity. It's an issue of quality, what it is. Um, trees produce an enormous number of leaves every year, and every year they're discarded. They literally litter the ground. Nature litters all of the time, and that's part of the beauty of nature. Nature is not conservative. It's not doing the absolute minimum possible. Think about all of those uh, scriptures that I just read. God promises to bless in abundance. If we have a system that is fully biodegradable, we don't need to be conservative about how much we have. We can have as much as we want. We can, we can have bountiful excess and because we're not hurting anyone in the process. That's the way that nature does it. It doesn't um, do the absolute minimum. 
It does what's right in the first place, and then it does it with extravagance. So that's a very big difference in attitude to what you, you generally hear. Um, uh, I, I kind of like this quote about renewable energy. Um, 99% of the planet is already solar powered. That's plants. Uh, and then all of the animals come from the plants. It's the one percent which is uh, that is not which is killing the planet. Um, so God set up this great energy source, the sun, to power the planet. And um, there's over a hundred times more harvestable energy than we use on the entire planet. So if we can actually get to a place of having fully renewable energy. It won't be a step down. It can actually be that, that we're, you know, we're, we're harnessing more energy, not less. We just need to figure out a way to do that in a sustainable way. And that's going to depend on the region. We, you know, I'm not proposing a global solution, but I'm saying that the, the potential resources are there. Um, and it, similarly, energy consumption doesn't have to be bad. Uh, there are ways that we can actually uh, enhance the environment so that we're harvesting more usable energy. Most of it's just bouncing back into space right now. Um, so I hope I've encouraged you to kind of get at these heart issues. Um, Jesus frequently talked about seeds and uh, good seeds and bad seeds. And what I've learned through this is that all of the environmental issues that people are upset about today, the things that are plaguing uh, animals and people alike, they come from the seed in the heart. And that if our heart issues are fear and selfishness and greed, then no matter what we try and do, no matter what labels we put on things, uh, the issues will still remain. They'll just be shuffled around. But if we start with a heart of trusting God in, uh, in letting go of our fear and giving freely and generously, that I believe that we can truly still live in the promised land. Thank you.